Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Bent Flubier, who is a professor at both Oxford and the IT University of Copenhagen. Uh, and also, um, I, and I think at one point you were a professor of planning. I don't, I don't know if you're still a professor of planning, but I didn't even know there was such a thing. Right? <laughs> I mean, is, is there a de- department of, of planning? We'll have to talk about that. But also the author of um, a couple books. Uh, the most recent book is called How Big Things Get Done. The Surprising Factors That Determine the Fate of Every Project from home renovations to space exploration and everything in between. Um, I also have another of your books uh, from way back called uh, uh, Rationality and Power, uh, Democracy in Practice. Welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, this book, um, I really enjoyed this book, How uh, Big Things um, Get Done. Um, And I don't know, it's kind of uh, something in the uh, field of... Um, behavioral political science, I don't know, behavioral organization theory, I mean, that might be redundant, but you talk about how uh, large initiatives and even small initiatives, um, they they rarely uh, get completed <laughs> within the time and the budget that we hope for and that we estimate for. And this is a result of psychological factors, uh, of course, but also um, political factors, right? And, and I like how you combine the two and you say that for smaller projects or maybe self-directed projects, it's more psychology as you get to bigger and bigger projects and projects that involve lots and lots of different players, then sort of the, the, the politics takes over, but both of these are, are involved. Um, and I think the statistics that you cite are that only about 8.5% of these large projects get completed on time and on budget. And only 0.5% get completed on time, on budget, and with the performance standards that they're hoping for. So these, these are pretty, pretty shocking numbers. And, and for me, you know, uh, when I have, do a home project and I get an estimate from a contractor and, and they give me an estimate, as a statistician, I'm always thinking, oh, so that must be the mean. <laughs> and of course, it's never the mean. It's always like the bare minimum. So, so maybe... I, I don't know where to start here, but you know, maybe start by I start by asking, um, what is this? Is this is this a field like project science? Well, uh, I don't think people call it project science, but project management is definitely a field. It's a huge field, actually, mm-hmm. both uh, in practice and and also in academia. Uh, I think more of my work as decision making. So this is about decision making and you're right in pointing out the behavioral aspects. So decision making about very big capital investments in all sorts of different fields uh, is what it's about. And uh, when you when you refer to your own situation, when you have, uh, you know, remodeling of your home, uh, a renovation of your home, and, and and some builder comes in and gives you a quote, you know, the real cynics there say that this is a down payment. It's, it's not, it's not definitely not a mean, it's not even a minimum. It's just a down payment, you know, that this is just to get you started. Uh, like when you buy something uh, in installments and you're buying your home renovation in installments and whatever the quote is, is your first installment. And then you go on from there. And, uh, you know, 50% uh, cost increase is not uncommon on jobs like that. And way be above that is not uncommon either, you know. So uh, I would say the average cost over on, of a home renovation is somewhere between 30 and 50%. And that means that you'll find many, many instances where it would be much more than that, including 100% and above. Yeah, right now I'm actually having someone work on a project in my home, <laughs> right? not too far from where I'm sitting. And, um, you know, it's very frustrating because the folks who are doing the project, I was asking for a, a drawing. I was asking to see, you know, a plan and, and they wouldn't give me a plan. They, they wouldn't give me a drawing. <laughs> they just said, oh, we're just going to do it. And uh, in my experience, when there's no drawing and there's no plan, the bad things happen. And uh, I recently had some curtain rods installed and again, no drawing, no plan. And of course, it took way, way longer. And so I think one of the lessons that you offer up is, um, without using these, this phrase, right, 
uh, measure twice, cut once, right? Or I think Abe Lincoln had, had a similar one. If you give me five minutes to cut down a tree, I'm going to spend three minutes sharpening my, my ax. So I guess why is it that people underestimate the importance of, of planning? Um, because we are hardwired to do it. You know, there's something called the planning fallacy that we all have. And uh, the planning fallacy specifically when it first was formulated was about time. So it's about mm -hmm. us underestimating time and it proved that uh, our brains are wired in a way where we uh, uh, consistently underestimate time. It's very easy to demonstrate. We all know it from our own lives and again and again and again, even though we know that it happens, we just step right into the trap. And that's the way it is with a lot of these uh, cognitive biases, as they are called, uh, including the planning fallacy, uh, which has later been expanded. I did a paper with Cass Sunstein of Harvard University where we expanded the planning fallacy and we call it the planning fallacy writ large because we, we don't only do this in regards to time. We actually do it with anything, including cost and benefits also. So we should uh, look at the planning fallacy as something more general than just applying to time. and uh, And... You know, the only way to uh, get beyond uh, a bias like that is to first become conscious about it. But that's not even enough. You know, it helps some. You might get rid of a bit of uh, your errors or your biases by being conscious about them. But you actually need to very proactively start using debiasing techniques of which we and others have developed some that we find that for us is in project management that we we now have lots of uh, colleagues and practitioners around the world using these tools and finding that you can actually overcome the planning fallacy. You can short circuit it by uh, not thinking too much about what you're doing, but just use empirical data. So for you, if you are doing a home renovation, let's say you are installing a new kitchen, instead of trying to figure out what it's going to cost and asking the builder to do an estimate of, you know, how many square meters of tiling, how many cabinets and, how many handles of this type, et cetera, et cetera, and then putting unit cost up on them and multiplying by the number you need and then adding all this up into a total and getting a wrong number because that number is going to be impacted by the planning fallacy and optimism. Uh, instead of that, you just like uh, ask your colleagues, your friends, your family, anybody who has had a kitchen renovation done, you know, the last five, 10 years, and you just ask them, Either how much did it cost, but even better, get a relative number. Ask how much did it go over budget? How much did it go over schedule? Let's say you ask 15 friends and family about that. You just add up the numbers you get. So they, they will vary a lot, but you just add them up and take the average. Then you apply that number as an adjustment to what your builder says. So you don't believe that first number. You don't believe it's a mean. Now you adjust it with something that will actually make it the mean because you take this uh, estimate from the builder that is impacted by optimism and the planning fallacy and now you actually eliminate optimism bias and the planning fallacy by having actual numbers for what happened on actual kitchen, kitchen renovations amongst your friends and family right that's the way to go about it this is this is sort of the hobby way to go about it so we have developed very hardcore tools statistical tools where you can do this for multi-billion dollar projects where we have the empirical data that are relevant for debiasing very large project, projects, uh, including transport infrastructure, water projects, IT projects, mining projects, uh, wind power projects, uh, other energy projects, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said, these are being used all over the world now, producing better forecasts because of the debiasing. And, you don't have to take my word for this. This has been independently uh, documented that the, the forecasts are more accurate. So the, the planning fallacy, I mean, it's related to this idea of the inside view, right? Where you view the project that you're undertaking as, as unique, right? As uh, one of a kind, right? And I guess the question is, why would the overestimation of the distinctiveness of the project lead to an underest systematic underestimation of the time and money it's going to take uh, as opposed to 
kind of a, a, a symmetric error, right? You know, you could just as easily overestimate its complication and overestimate its um, difficulty as, as underestimate. So it's, it's kind of an overestimation of its uniqueness combined with, with a, a bias in the direction of optimism, right? Yep. That's exactly correct. And and it is surprising when you first start looking at these data and you would expect, you know, sort of just from the way we have learned to think about statistics and errors and so on, we would think about it as random errors. And as you say, they are symmetrical. Uh, and that means that you would overestimate as often as you would underestimate, let's say, schedule. And that is definitely not the case when you look at it. They are like uh, a lot more uh, underestimates of the schedule than there are overestimates or overestimates. So this is clearly not a random error that is going on here. It is a bias as the psychologists have established. And uh, the uniqueness bias, which is an additional, we've already talked now about optimism bias, the planning fallacy, and here comes the uniqueness bias. And actually there are dozens and dozens of uh, biases like this that impact our behavior. Uniqueness bias, the way that it impacts our behavior is that it makes us not look at other projects. So actually, uniqueness bias is a pretty mean bias in the sense that it makes us ignore re reality. It, you know, if you think my project is unique, you have no reason to look at other projects and, 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 and go out and search knowledge about what happened in other projects because it's irrelevant per definition because you think your project is unique, right? And that's so, really so it's dangerous. Like, so, so, it's like, so, it, so it basically opens the door to, to the optimism. I, I was thinking yeah. you know, in finance, when we're valuing companies, we'll often use comparables, right? Or we're, when we're valuing real estate, we'll use uh, comparables. Um, and I was just teaching this in my finance class recently. You know, people were saying, well, why would you use like the median, um, uh, say, price to earnings ratio when every company is unique? Why don't you find the one company that is most like your company and then apply that multiple. And I think the response to that, even though in theory that sounds right, the response to that would be, well, if you allow yourself to pick that one comparable, then you're probably going to pick the one that gives you the number that you, you know, subconsciously, you know, want to find, right? Exactly. It introduces, you don't want a, degree of free, it introduces a degree of freedom that, that allows your bias to kind of take over. Exactly. And that's what you want to avoid. Basically, you don't want to think the more you allow your brain to work, the more biases you're going to have. I mean, if you're allowing your brain to work in this manner where it's it's trying to figure out things for this specific project, if you allow your brain to work in collecting data on similar projects where it's an empirical fact that these data had the performance that they did, and now you use this empirical fact as your base rates for what you're doing, then you're doing the right thing, then you're thinking the right way. But if you're thinking the conventional way where you're trying to understand things inside out, so you, you understand your product from the inside without taking other products into account, that's when you open the doors for all these cognitive biases that we have because you have to make everything up right. So your mind will make it up. And the mind is very good at making things up and uh, that's what you have to be careful about when you when you are working with uh, with big investment decisions. Well, I like how you know when you ask somebody how long their commute is, they'll often say, "Well, it's thirty minutes when there's no traffic." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you say, "Well, how often is there no traffic?" Well, kind of never, right? And so they're they're you're gravitating towards kind of the the, the reality <laughs> that they, that they want uh, to be true. Um, yes. But you also mentioned that. You know, even if we have a good estimate of the, the average, right? You know, we're, we're objective. We've looked at the data. We've found the right group of comparables. And then we come up with an average. That's not enough because um, we tend to then think in terms of normal distribution and the distribution is not normal. I mean, you, you, you call it fat tails, but really, I guess what you're saying is it's skewed. Because the, the, the tails on the left end are typically not that fat. It's the tails on the right end, right, that are, that are really fat. So we, when we get overruns, we get, you know, really big overruns sometimes. That, that is correct, that uh, uh, you can't just look at the average. Basically, we find that the vast majority of capital investment decisions and projects are fat tailed in their performance. And that's both for cost and for schedule and for benefits. And of course, where the fat tail is depends on what variable you're looking at. So for costs, 
it's the upper tail that's fat. So you have more cost overruns than you have underruns. And therefore, the distribution is both skewed and, and fat tailed. For statistician, it means that uh, uh, that uh, kurtosis and skewness is high. And uh, the same with schedule, same pattern as cause. But for benefits, it'll be the opposite. You actually have fewer benefits overrun than you have underrun. So the fat tail is on the left side instead of the, the right side of the distribution. But again, uh, the distribution is skewed and it is fat tailed. So that's what we that's what we struggle with. And and most people have simply not taken statistics classes where they know how to uh, how to do statistical analysis of on fat tail distribution. They don't. Most people know what a mean and variance is, right? But most people actually don't know what skewness and kurtosis is, and and certainly not how to use it in a statistical test. Not to even speak of. Uh, the alpha values of Pareto distribution and so on, which is even more long-haired and, and, and difficult. So basically you have, you have a, a group of people, the experts, and this is both practitioners and academics actually, uh, who are supposed to be dealing with these things, who don't understand the statistics of these things. And not only do they not understand the statistics of these things, they think they know the statistics of these things because they all took Statistic 101 right. And then they apply statistics 101, which is based on averages and, and, and standard deviations on the performance of these investments. And it all goes to hell because all of a sudden you think you have an analysis of the risk, but you don't. It's actually worse than having no analysis because now you have an analysis that you actually think is the analysis of risk, but it's totally misleading, not just a little. It's, it's very, very misleading and you're worse off uh, listening to the people who did this analysis than you would be having no analysis of all, at all. But of course, you'd be much, much better off having people who actually understand how to do fat tail risk analysis. People like Nassim Nicholas Taleb, people like Mandelbrot and, and so on, uh, people like Daniel Kahneman, they, they understand uh, what fat tails are about and what they do to us. But the vast majority of people have no clue and they think they do. That's the problem. Now, when I think of fat tails, I think, of course, of financial markets. Um, and, and the reason why you have these fat tails is because of these, these feedback loops, right? You know, because of these interdependencies, because of complexity. And, and, and when you see the fat tails in, in the project world, it's, it's also because of these, these interdependencies, right? Where, you know, the probability of an error in any one dimension is not independent right, of the, the probability of an error in any other dimension, right? So can, can, can projects be made more complex or, or less complex? I mean, I, I really loved your insight yes. about, you know, modularity and how, you know, modular projects, um, you know, it's less likely that, you know, it, so the, the end, up the in one area is, is going to impact the other ones. Yeah, the answer is that that you you can make uh, projects less complex. So first, you're right in observing that uh, fat tails are generated because of interdependencies and complexity. And these this can be both technical interdependencies, but also social interdependencies. You know, when we do projects, it's not just a technical thing; it's also a social thing. Lots of people are working on big projects, and uh, and there's lots of technology used. So you'll have both technological independent interdependencies, and you'll have social and even political interdependencies on these types of projects generating this kind of complexity. The way out of this, and this is something we are, uh, we, we, we just touched upon it in the book. We started this, uh, we were actually starting to do the empirical analysis. So I included some of it in the book and it's, it's really resonated with people. There's been a lot of response to this. Now we're going into much more depth with much more rigor. And what the data show is that modular projects uh, have less complexity and perform much better. So your cost overruns are much more, smaller, your schedule overruns are, are much uh, smaller and your benefits uh, overruns are, are larger. So you get more benefits. And um, modularity introduces a kind of standardization into projects. So it's, it's not so difficult to understand that uh, when things are modular, you don't have to think about what's inside the box, you know, you just need to know what the module is and that it interfaces with other modules in the way that works. It's just like Lego. That's actually what we call it in the book. And, and the thing that I actually seriously ask of all the many managers and leaders that I work with, I'm asking them, what's your Lego? If you don't have a Lego, you have a problem. 
And you need to know what your Lego is. You need to develop your thinking about what you are doing in projects and, and capital investments in a way where you actually have a Lego to, that you're using as a basic building block, maybe several Legos that you're using as basic building blocks to build your projects. Maybe the most clear example I can give of this is solar energy, which is hugely successful and is scaling up at an insane speed right now all over the world. It's completely modular. You know, the solar cell is born modular because the solar cell, just the word the cell, you know, likes the Lego. That's the Lego. That's your solar cell. It's tiny. And uh, you put a bunch of these cells on a panel. You have a solar panel. Also a Lego. So you use one Lego to build another Lego. Now you put a lot of these panels uh, next to each other and link them up. Now you have a solar array. That's called an array, you know. Again, this is a model. Now we've got, gone up three steps. So we're just scaling this thing up, but based on the same basic Lego, right? So first one Lego, then we have a second Lego, the panel. Now we have the array. That's the third Lego. Then we use arrays. We just put up a lot of arrays. Now we have a solar farm, you know. That's the fourth level. And if you don't have enough energy, which we don't in just one solar farm, obviously, we build lots of solar farms, which is exactly what's happening now. That's the fifth level up. But it's all just based on this one Lego. You just replicate, replicate, replicate what you're doing. And when you do that, you get really good at it. You're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. When you do that, you get something called positive learning curves. The costs come down. That's the positive learning curve. And solar has the steepest positive learning curve that we know of right now. So a lot of things have positive learning curves, but solar has particularly steep positive learning curve, meaning that the costs are coming down over time and we do it faster. So speed ramps up and cost ramps down. That's a beautiful combination. That's exactly what we want when we're doing things. So that's what modularity does for you. Wind, wind farms, the same thing. So built on wind turbines, which basically consist of four basic elements, foundation, tower, nacelle, that's the turbine, and blades. Boom, you're done, you know, and you build these giant mills, windmills within 24 hours today. That used to take months, you know, to build uh, at the outset. It used to take months to build uh, turbines that were much smaller. Now, 24 hours to get them up, and they're all manufactured in factories, which makes it very economical. At the other end of the scale, you have non-modularity. So things that are bespoke, like you build a, a piece of a signature architecture, you know, where the architect really gets to unfold uh, their imagination and so on. It's a one-off thing. Everything is bespoke. Or a nuclear power plant, they are also uh, bespoke and they're built on site. You know, they're not built in factories. They're basically, things are welded and done on site. It's a very classical example of construction sites. And you can't make anything efficient uh, and modular if you have a construction site. You need to bring it into factories in order to do that. So we need to get rid of the construction site and make it into an assembly site where we assemble the Legos that I'm talking about. And only if you do that will you be successful and have uh, positive learning curves and high performing projects. So this is what I tell the construction industry. You need to get rid of the construction site. That's a, that's a hard one to swallow for the construction industry because they identify with that. But what I'm saying is you will not make it into the 20th century. I'm not even talking about the 21st century. I'm saying you're not going to make it into the 20th century, which is the century of industrialization, standardization, manufacturing, until you standardize construction, meaning that you need to manufacture your Legos and bring them on site to assemble them, not to build them. Well, I, I talk a lot about Legos in, in my classes, but usually in the context of business models and uh, IT. Um, and of course, you know, having a Danish person talk about Legos is, is pretty, uh, is, is pretty natural. But, but I, I think, you know, some people might think that, you know, bespoke, it's really bespoke versus uh, standard. When you have these standard building blocks, then this allow this makes bespokeness a whole lot easier, right? So, I mean, the you use the example of the Empire State Building. I mean, this is a one of a kind building, but it's it's made of you know these standard components that they would just stack on top of one another, right? Yes. So uh, we described the the Empire State Building in the book. You know, the whole process and and and. Uh, why it was so successful. It was built in 14 months. You know, it's, it's incredible. I mean, to think they were building 
you know, like 10 stories a week when they really got into it. So they had positive learning curves and they, they basically said, no, we didn't build a 102 story skyscraper. We just built the same story 102 times, you know, and, and of course the first, the first story where they, where they built that, that was a bit difficult, like most things we do the first time, but the, already on the second, they could use what they learned on the first one. And then the third faster, the fourth faster. And, you know, after they got to uh, around 10 stories or so, they really, they really had learned how to do this and they could go up really fast. So that's the explanation that they could build it so fast that they just thought out this one story, which was the standard building block, and they did it over and over. And also, they had totally nailed down what goes into building one story, like what are... How many windows, how many stones of this kind, you know, how many, how much cladding for the facade or whatever. So they, uh, they, they, it, they actually had built the project on paper in detail before they built it in reality. And that's actually the secret. So when you mentioned earlier, you couldn't get a drawing. I'm telling you, nobody would have started the, the Empire State Building without getting a drawing. It was all totally specified in drawings and lists, you know, on, on, on what needed to go into each and every uh, story of the building and and when that material needed to be on the site in order for the builders to assemble it it was already an assembly site at that stage they they understood this more than a hundred years ago it's pretty thought provoking when you think about it and a lot of builders today don't still don't get it well you you, you have one chapter where you contrast the you know frank gary's uh, bilbao museum and the sydney opera house <laughs> I, I can't think of two you know, buildings that are more opposite in, in terms of their, um, their con construction approach, right? Um, where one is planned down to the, to the, to the dot of the I and the cross of the T and the other one's just a, let's, let's go in and start winging it. Right. Yeah. So, um, so the two buildings are very similar in the sense that they are architectural marvels, right? And I think they together actually are considered the two most exquisite buildings of the last century or something like that. And we know that the Sydney Opera House is the only building that got UNESCO heritage status while the architect was still alive. That has never happened before. That's usually very old buildings, you know, uh, that are historical. Uh, but both buildings are exquisite, but uh, that's where the similarity ends, you know, as you say, that they were built so differently. Actually, in, in, in Sydney, they started building before they knew what they were going to build. They actually didn't have the drawing. So they did like your builder wants, you know, to do. But for an opera house, say, hey, just start building, just start digging. That's actually a slogan you often hear in the construction industry. And that's exactly what they did. At Benelong Point, where the Sydney Opera House is located, they just started digging without knowing uh, exactly what they were going to build. And of course, when you do that, that comes back as a boomerang and hits you in many, many ways. And one of the most uh, dramatic ones uh, was that they actually had to dynamite part of the Opera House. After it had been built, they had to dynamite it in order to get it back into accordance with the drawings that the architect has made. And I mean, you can, it's, it's easy to understand if you build like that, it's going to be very slow and very costly. And indeed, the Sydney Opera House went 10 years over schedule and 1,400% over budget. Whereas the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum was built on schedule, actually finished, uh, you know, a few, uh, a few weeks before the opening. And it was built slightly under budget. The budget was $100 million, uh, which is not even expensive for a building like that. And it was delivered at $97 uh, million, so slightly under, under budget. And I would, I would say that uh, this, the Guggenheim Bilbao is an even more complex design than the Sydney Opera House, even though both are very complex. But Gary uh, thought it all through exactly like the Empire State Building before he started building. He's probably the best builder I know that understands how to use IT to simulate his buildings before he builds them. So he can make all the mistakes on the computer before they go out and, and build in reality so that they don't have to make the mistakes in reality. And it's really cheap to make mistakes on, on the computer compared to making the mistakes in reality, which is obvious to most people. Uh, and you want to make the mistakes on the computer and not in reality. That's what Gary does. That explains his fast delivery times and his delivery on budget. 
Well, and, and another contrast you throw up is how Pixar makes movies versus, you know, Heaven's Gate, right? <laughs> Which is sort of the, yeah. you know, let's just, let's just start filming and, and see how it goes, right? Yeah, that, that's actually quite common. It's shocking when you read, I, I think it's fascinating to read about how people do projects in different industries. And I think that uh, Hollywood is one of the most interesting industries of the film industry in, in general. And if you look at it historical, there, historically, there are many, many instances where people just start shooting and seeing and sees how it, it, see how it goes. Uh, Pixar is the exact opposite of that. They, they do like Gary. And it's very interesting, actually, uh, Pixar's way of planning and Gary's way of planning, even though they're doing completely different products. One is like, uh, you know, architectural marvels and the other is film marvels. Their process is the same with the, they, they simulate their product before they actually start doing it in reality. They understand this is how to do it and this is how to save a lot of money. And Pixar has actually found a sweet spot. Uh, they don't want the budgets to go over that. They find that the movies actually don't get better by throwing more money at them. Uh, ab above a certain limit, it actually gets worse, you know, and, and the money does no good, you know. So you actually, you need to have your process in place and money will not solve your problems if you don't do it. It's one lesson. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, Pixar uh, is going through eight or nine iterations of the film in increasing detail from just having an idea on one page to have a 125 page manuscript to having storyboards, just a, you know, a dozen, a few dozen storyboards to having thousands of storyboards uh, and filming it on their iPhones and putting in just, uh, you know, their own voices and their own music on and so on. In, uh, uh, so that they, they totally know what they're doing once they go out and hire, you know, the really expensive people, the, the, the famous actors that are doing the voices in most Pixar movies and, and use the expensive technology where you're actually, uh, where you're actually uh, shooting the film uh, on, the, on, on, on the computers that, that do animation. Uh, and and you get the, the the expensive composers to to compose the score for the film and so on. That's only much much later when they've done the film eight nine times already. So they it's just like they just do it the tenth time now, and then that's the final version. But they really know what they're doing. That's the secret. And no other studio in more than a hundred years of Hollywood history has had this many blockbusters, like one blockbuster after another, twenty plus times now. It doesn't happen, and therefore it's uh, it's it's completely certain that this is not just by luck. You know, you can't get that many uh, movies uh, as success uh, blockbusters by luck. There's a methodology to it, and in the book we uncover that methodology, and we say that you can use this methodology in what you're doing because there are some basic principles here, and it's. Think things through before you do them. Simulate things before you do them. Experiment with things before you do them. Iterate things before you do them. Uh, uh, replicate things before you do them. Uh, on the computer or in reality, Gary is using both physical models and computer models. So, and sometimes mock-ups, you know, which are one one-to-one -one, uh, models that you know they just rent a field somewhere and then they they go build what they they are building to see what does this actually look like in reality, and they do all these things as preparation. And only when they know what they're going to do in, in detail will they actually go out and, 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 and deliver the product itself, whether it's a building or it's a movie uh, with Pixar. We, we call it in the book, think slow, act fast. So you need this slow process up front. For, for Gary, it's typically a couple of years. For Pixar, same thing, you know, where you really think things through before you go out and build them. And if you don't do that, you'll be forced to act slow because all the problems that you didn't deal with during the planning phase are going to come back to haunt you during the delivery phase. That's why delivery for the Sydney Opera House was so long, whereas delivery for uh, the Guggenheim Bilbao was, was so short, you know. In Sydney, every problem in the book came back to bite them and they had to deal with it on the construction site, which is exactly where you don't want it. So I think, I mean, the idea is that every, every dollar you spend on planning saves you a, a lot more than a dollar on execution. But look, I can, I can see how somebody might read a one paragraph summary of your book and 
get it completely wrong, right? I mean, here in Silicon Valley, everyone says, you know, bias for action, right? You know, don't spend time drawing up a business plan, you know, get out there and, and start making and get the stuff in front of the customer. Um, you know, we have this, um, there's this exercise that I do a lot with uh, executives that you're probably familiar with, you know, this famous, you know, marshmallow tower exercise. And, and, and the takeaway of, of course, is that, you know, you, you don't want to be spending 90% of your time planning and 10% of your time building uh, because then you don't have an opportunity to, to, to learn. Uh, and I think people might take away from that. Oh, well, you know, we don't want to have a bias for action, but, but the lesson really is completely in line with what you're suggesting, which is that, you know, you, you have to start the learning right away. Right. And the folks who are proponents of the lean startup approach, I mean, that's exactly what you're doing. You're, 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 you're you know, you're failing cheaply instead of failing expensively. Right. And so before exactly. you actually, you know, invest huge amounts, uh, there's an example that I use in, in my class, which is the uh, contrast between um, web van and Instacart. Right. And, you know, web van took billions of dollars of investor money and, it all disappeared because they thought that, you know, they couldn't ship their first bag of groceries until they had warehouses and trucks and, you know, all this stuff. And then, you know, that's when they shipped and that's when they realized that, you know, they got it all wrong. So uh, what do you say to some of these, you know, S Silicon Valley types who would say, you know, bias for action, get out there, right? They might say, you right. know, McClelland wanted to plan every battle and so he never, he never did any fighting. Exactly. So uh, when we wrote the book, we actually feared that this would be a misunderstanding about the book, you know, that people would say, oh, the, we are arguing for all this planning. This is exactly the opposite of agile, right? And, uh, and lean. So we would be like dinosaurs. <laughs> but luckily, it has not happened, actually. And we, and we make quite an effort in the book to explain why the two approaches are similar. So why agile is similar to what we do and why uh, minimum viable product is, is similar to what we do. However, we make a distinction that people in Silicon Valley often don't make, but I think it's really important. That is between reversible and non-reversible decisions. This so if Amazon you're doing calls, so, this is what this is what Amazon refers to as the one way and two way doors, right? Exactly. And, and Amazon actually gets this. Uh, they're intelligent about this. They understand that if you have a reversible decision, like a two-way door, like just go through it and you go back, you know, if it doesn't work, just you can do it like uh, with a minimum viable product, uh, provided that there's no safety issues and stuff, you know. It is a problem when people take this approach and, and start applying it in, in industries where it doesn't work like that, where there are safety issues or you can't just uh, roll back that, that it's a one-way door. So Theranos is a, a good example of this. I think that they were using the Silicon Valley software model for developing medical devices for blood tests, right? Not a good idea because the, the rules and regulations, safety standards and so on are completely different. Uh, and, uh, and it's a mistake to use the model there. We say the same thing that if you're building a, a skyscraper or you're building California high-speed rail as is happening now, you can't just experiment. You don't put a minimum viable product out for California high-speed rail, you know, and then see what happens. And then you just you just uh, abandon the the high-speed rail line if it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So so uh, for for non-reversible decision, we recommend instead of a minimum viable product, we we recommend a minimum. Uh, virtual product that Max, you actually, maximum maximum virtual. Yeah, sorry. Product, right? yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Maximum virtual. Thank you for correcting me there. That that could have gone very wrong. Uh, <laughs> a maximum virtual product where where we say you need to max out in in virtual space in simulating your product before you go real, right? When it's non reversible, you really need to understand what you're doing when it's non reversible because you cannot reverse it. So you need to know that once you go through that door, you did the right thing. You have the right thing in your hand, you have the right product in your hand. And that's what the maximum uh, virtual product will, will guarantee for you. That's what Pixar does. That's what Gary does. That's what the other intelligent success stories that we study and describe in the book do. And that's what you need to do if you're doing a project that is non-reversible. But for the reversible pro reversible products, by all means, you know, experiment without going through all this planning first, that's fine. 
Well, that's also, I think Amazon refers to it, you know, they use the PRFAQ process, right? Which is, yeah. you know, doing as much as you can, right, in on paper uh, and getting feedback uh, before you actually, you know, start making major investments, right? That's what we, in the book, we call that thinking from right to left and, and the PRFAQ, which stands for you know, a, a press release is the PR and FAQ stands, of course, for frequently asked questions. So immediately when, when Amazon has an idea for a new idea, they say, okay, before we go any further, could somebody please sit down and write a press release for, you know, how are we going to launch this product the day that we, we got, we're just now imagining in our heads that we already have the product. How do we describe it to the public, to the journalists who are coming tomorrow, you know, for the press meeting? And, uh, what questions are they going to ask uh, and how are we going to answer those? That's the FAQ. This is a way to sort of jump way into the future and imagine your product is already finished, right? That's the right side of the project planning chart. You know, when you see project planning chart, they usually move from left to right. Amazon uh, makes this leap straight to the right at first to develop uh, a clear idea of what is it actually we're going to end up with. And then they work their way backwards. That's what they call think backwards at Amazon. Uh, and we call it think from right to left in our book that, uh, that it's about, you need to ask why you're doing a project and you're putting that out on the right of your, uh, of your project uh, planning uh, diagram. And then no matter where you are, when you start delivering the project, you always know, uh, or if you don't know, you look at the diagram and you know what you're going to end up with. And, and, and by always knowing what it is that you're going to end up with, you have a pretty strong steer on what you're doing because you can decide, is what I'm doing right now going to contribute to what we want to end up with? Or is it not? If it's not, you, you abandon it and do something else that actually will contribute. If it does contribute, you just continue what you're doing. So you get a, 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 a good steer where everybody knows what they're doing. And that's what you need to have a successful team delivering your product. Now, look, we've been talking only about kind of psychology, but uh, the book spends an equal amount of time on on politics, right? And, you know, I had a foundation, some foundation work done recently. And, of course, I picked the company with the lowest estimate. <laughs> and then, you know, once they came in, they, they started saying, well, you know, you, you got a window here. We need to replace the window. It's like you did a walk around. You saw that window. But, you know, once they've got you, then they they can start you know, jacking up the, the prices because you're, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck. And so, you know, you talk about strategic misrepresentation. Um, I had a old professor of mine who worked in the white house under the Bush administration. And one of his tasks was to estimate the cost of, you know, invading and occupying a foreign country. And his, his numbers were unacceptable because they were too high. Right. Uh, so you had to go back to the drawing board and, and come up with, with a much lower number in order to get the project through. Um, I mean, this is, seems to be pervasive, the, this idea of kind of, you know, low-balling things. Why, why do people fall Absolutely. for it? The, I mean, the, it? Well, there's a lot of organizational pressure. Sometimes they don't fall for it. They have to. You know, they are, they are forced by the, by the bosses upstairs uh, to do it because maybe they did what your, uh, you know, what the, the person in the White House that you described uh, did. That they came up with the budget, and then they were just told, "This is too high. This is too high. We're not going to get approval for this. So you need to adjust it down." And then that's your job, and 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 you do it. So that's not so much falling for it as being forced to do it. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of organizational pressure, and it's both in the private sector and in in the public sector. So this is not just a government thing. Uh, I've had the vice president of a huge uh, IT company that you would know, but I'm not free to say who they are, honestly telling me here in Oxford that this is their business model, that they actually deliberately uh, oversell their, their products and then they just deal with it later when it comes back as uh, schedule overruns and cost right. overruns. Of course, the clients get, uh, the customers get very unhappy like you would, but hey, that's just the way it is. And they, his argument was, if we don't do it, we don't win the jobs and we need to be in business. So to be in business, we actually need to strategically misrepresent. It's very dangerous. I have to say, I teach my students uh, that they have to be, just don't do it. Because in this day and age with the legislation we have, you can actually end up in jail for doing this. This is actually misleading uh, customers. And it might also be misleading your shareholders, you know, that you, that you misrepresent what things are worth and what they cost and so on. 
So it used to be something that you could do, uh, you know, until the Sarbanes Oxley uh, acts, uh, you could do this without a great risk of uh, getting into legal trouble. You definitely cannot do it anymore without getting into le- having a risk of getting into legal trouble. Actually, a CEO on a, and a big nuclear project in the U.S. recently went to jail because of this. Mm. But you can, if you're trying to get a project through, right, you can leverage the escalation of commitment. You can leverage the sunk cost fallacy. I mean, you were talking about the California high-speed rail project. I mean, I, I think there was a reason why they started in Bakersfield, right? Because they, they knew that, you know, it, it's it's – the the demand for it isn't in Bakersfield, right? So if they have, you know, half of it built in Bakersfield, then at that point, then there's going to be, hey, let's just finish it. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this, and I don't know if it's apocryphal, but um, the Philadelphia Museum of Art it is, a, it's basically a C-shaped building. And when they started the construction, they didn't have enough money to fund the entire construction. So they started construction from the outside, Right. They started on the left wing and the right wing. And, you know, then everybody would drive past and see that it was missing a big chunk in the middle. And that's how they were able to <laughs> shake down all the, the donors because <laughs> they would say, hey, you know, yeah. do you want to have <laughs> these two disconnected parts or, or do you want to have like, you know, an actual museum? Now, if they'd started in the middle, then after they'd finished the middle part, the donors would have been like, that's good enough. <laughs> right. So. So, I mean, you can strategically. Right. right. right uh, manipulate people's. um you know, you know, motivations, right? Yeah, and 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 people do that. Uh, I hope the same thing will happen for the California high speed rail line. Oh, although I'm not certain, I think that they probably should have started building from Los Angeles towards San Francisco and from San Francisco towards Los Angeles in order to mm. have people come in and say, "Hey, this doesn't make sense. We need to connect these two lines that right. are now going uh, in and out of Los Angeles and San Francisco. I, I'm not sure that people are going to pay enough attention to the line between Bakersfield and uh, Merced uh, that they would actually think that, okay, then it needs to go to LA and to San Francisco, but we'll see. I, I hope I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Now you also uh, talk about, I mean, Albert Hirschman and I am a big fan of Albert Hirschman, but I had not. Me too. Know about Me this. too. And I didn't know about this this book okay. that he wrote, which seems to be a, an a, an ode to serendipity, right? And you know, yeah. he points out a couple examples of botched projects that you know led to something positive. So, I mean, can, is there something to be said for you know, hey, let's just? I mean, it's kind of like primary research in a sense. Um, uh, com- when you try to do something that's new, you try to do something that's never been done before. You know, maybe some kind of fantastic learning will will come out of it. Um, but of course, there's no data in his book. It's just a bunch of anecdotes. Yeah, he just he just has a, a few. Uh, I think he has about eleven projects that are from very different geographies and that are examples of his thesis. But of course, that's not a statistical test. So what we do in the book is we actually submit. Hirschman's uh, thesis to a statistical test where we look at more than 2,000 projects and say, okay, if we, it's the same type of projects that that, that Hirschman looked at, but uh, we just get a real sample. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, his thesis only applies for a minority of projects. So one out of, one out of uh, five and uh, four out of five do the opposite. So his thesis was that just start digging. So he was actually a proponent for just start digging. Human creativity. Drive into the blizzard, right? Any... Drive into the blizzard that, uh, that the behavioral economists talk about exactly. And then you will have uh, then you will have escalation of commitment because you'll have to. You'll have to finish the damn thing. And uh, during that process, you'll realize that you actually have a lot of creativity that you didn't that you didn't know that you had, and that will help you solve the problem. Now, there's an element of truth in this, and there are beautiful examples of it working. And we actually mentioned several such examples uh, in the book. Uh, I would say the Sydney Opera House is actually an example of, of Hirschman working, you know, like the Sydney Opera House, even with a, a giant cost overrun, it's made much more money, you know, for Sydney and Australia 
and given much more joy, you know, to people visiting than anybody could have ever hoped for when they started. So maybe just start digging was okay, except it killed the career of the architect, which was a fellow Dane. So I'm not happy about that, that this guy, Jörn Utzon, who was the architect of the Sydney Opera House, never got to do another major building. He actually withered away as a teaching assistant in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, so so not a, not, a, not a good thing. But anyway, there are examples and it is, um, it's a good story, but if you relied on it consistently and say, hey, that's just how we do projects, you would actually end up losing and, and you would have huge waste. You know, that's what our statistical analysis uh, uh, of 2000 plus uh, projects show. So Hersman was dead wrong on, on, on this point, even though he was right. And I, like you, I'm a great fan of his thinking. I've used his thinking in, in many other parts of my research where his idea was innovative and sound. In this case, they were innovative and unsound. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you spent some time talking about Terminal 5 at, at Heathrow, and you hold this up as sort of a, a really ca good case study of, of successful execution of a large project. And, I mean, there are like a million moving parts in, in this project, and there were tons of different contractors, you know, all involved in this thing. And, you know, you, how, did, how did something like that get done? I think... You, you talk a lot about kind of the, there's a big human element, right? So it's not just about having the the detailed plan. It's not just about having these inch stones, which I love this concept of the inch stone instead of the milestone. But th there seemed to be like a, you know, esprit de corps, right, that was produced, um, which is lacking in many of these projects. I mean, I know my sister's an architect, and she says the contractors and the architects, they're always bickering and the, the contractors and subcontractors are always bickering and there's always lawsuits and everything. Um, I mean, if, if there were no lawsuits that came out of Terminal 5, I would be, I would, I would, I would be incredulous. But, um, but how did they, you know, what was the secret to, to getting this done on time and under, under budget? I actually don't think there were any lawsuits. There might have been some minor stuff, but nothing like what you usually see. Uh, I won't rule out that there was some minor stuff, but I haven't heard about it. But not the major things that you see on most uh, projects. And this was very deliberate. They basically decided we don't want any lawsuits. So we're going to write the contracts in a way that makes it very unlikely that we get lawsuits uh, where the owner, which was BAA, so the aviation organization that uh, owned uh, the airport and other airports in the UK at that time, and they said, we are going to take on the risk. We are not going to try to pass on the risk to the builders. We will actually, as an intelligent client, own the risk. And then we'll collaborate with the, the builders to solve problems as they arise, which they will. And they knew that. Uh, so it was a completely different approach and a completely different type of contract. It's called a partnering contract, where, where partnering is the basis of the contract. Instead of this antagonistic relationship that most contract has, it specifies the responsibilities of different parties. And then as soon, sometimes actually long before you even start building, people start suing each other and, and pushing the responsibility around saying, this is not my responsibility because you know, contracts always leave scope for interpretation. And then you will always try to argue that it's the other party's responsibility. If it's a negative risk or a negative cost, it's certainly not yours. So enormous amounts of time are spent on this kind of, of a battle. Now, the owners of Terminal 5 decided we don't want that. We're using this other partnering approach, and they were completely consistent from contract to how they built the team. I happen to know the guy who was the project leader on this team, and we interviewed him intensively for the book. And he had this saying, his name is Andrew Wolstenholm, and he's been a leader on many big projects uh, here in the UK. He, he, he uh, had a career in the military before he started doing projects. And he had this concept of the cap badge. Oh, uh, so in, in the UK military, there's a badge on your cap that says uh, which, uh, you know, which company or division uh, you are, you are uh, belonging to. And he said to everybody who got on the project, now you leave your cap badge at the door. There's only one cap badge here and that's Terminal 5. I don't care which company you're working for, which contractor or which consultancy or whatever. Uh, here you're working for the Terminal 5 team and we need everybody to understand this and work like this, not just as as something we say, but something we actually feel and do. And he was so insistent on this and so intensive, you know, in working for it and, and, and all the way through 
not just like saying it up front, but every day making sure that everybody was practicing what they were preaching. And they actually succeeded in this, that, that, uh, that everybody felt that, hey, we are one team here and it doesn't matter which company I'm from. When I'm on the site for Terminal 5, I'm working for the Terminal 5 team and we are one team and that's it. And we solve, we solve problems together. And we give examples of, in the book of how this happened. It's very different from reading stories from conventional construction sites uh, that are, are run on the basis of conventional contracts. So uh, it's not that, that problems don't arise and conflicts don't uh, need to be solved, but the way you do it is very different. You're just going, hey, we are now, you know, we are two or three parties to this problem and we need to collaborate in order to solve it. That's what we're doing. And we'll get additional money from the client. We know it's going to be more expensive. We're not going to fight over who's going to pay this, which, which will be the usual situation. We're just talking to the owner and say, hey, we need 100 million more pounds in order to solve this problem. And they would get the money. There were money set aside for this. And it ended up making the project cheaper than it otherwise would have been. Well, it sounded like they also had something like a Kanban system in place where anybody who spotted a problem would feel comfortable escalating it, right? Yeah, they had that too. And they, in general, they just took good care of their workers. That they, they, they like uh, small things that, uh, you know, like if, if, uh, if your safety glass is broke, you just get another one. And some sites that you get one set and that's your responsibility then. And if they break, you're going to have to get them yourself. Or if some of your equipment or clothing gets wet, you just go and get dry equipment, you know, and, and again, on, on some sites, uh, on most sites, that's not the case. You know, they don't have extra, uh, mm-hmm. they don't have extra equipment like that for use at the whim of the, uh, of the, of the workers. But at T5, they had that and, and, uh, you know, it meant that people felt really well taken care of. And that's actually given back as loyalty, you know, to, to the team uh, of, of T5. And uh, and so there there was a real spirit of uh, we are in this together and we need to deliver this together and we want to be successful. That's what you want. Now, uh, toward, before the podcast, we were talking about how now most of your focus is on kind of IT projects. And in the book, um, you know, most of it's about construction and, uh, you know, large physical projects. But, you know, where the big capital investments are being made now are in these gigantic kind of cloud migrations and, you know, IT um, digital transformations and so forth. Um, can we just map over a, a lot of these insights onto, you know, IT projects is, is there, and, um, I think hopefully you're having a new book come out on this, but I mean, what, what is, is there any, anything that is, is different that we need to think about when we look at these digital projects? First, I want to emphasize that I'm not only interested in digital products now. I'm just, I've turbocharged my research on digital projects uh, because I think digitalization is one of the global trends that really matter. But I think that there are other trends that really matter. For instance, decarbonization. So I'm just as interested in decarbonization as I am in digitalization. Just to take two major trends where trillions of dollars are actually being invested. And it's very important that we... uh, We invest them right if we're not going to have humongous waste in society globally. Uh, But back to digital projects, uh, the problem with digital projects is that they are the worst performing project type of any, and not just by a little, by far. Now, when you look at the fat tails on different project types, and and we can show these in diagrams, you just have like IT is completely out there with its own separate tail that no, no other project type or no other investment type comes even close to. So uh, IT is, is, is really risky and the, spe- the risk is very specific. It's actually not, there's a lot of IT projects that actually deliver on schedule and, and on, on budgets, but when they go wrong, they go really wrong. And there's a large percentage, about 18% of IT projects totally blow out. You know, they become uh, what's called extreme values in extreme value theory. So they are far out on the curve in the fat tail. And that's a lot, you know, that's like, a, 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 again, a one in five risk of ending up as one of these projects whenever you're doing an IT project. You, ha- you actually have a risk of uh, one in five for more than a 400% uh, cost overrun when you do an IT project. 
And that's the average in the tail. So there are projects in the tail that would go even higher than the 400% uh, percent, uh, cost overrun. So we're talking about real risk here. Now, we just talked about digitalization as a world trend, you know, and I would argue that today, every project is increasingly becoming a digital project. Every project is increasingly becoming an IT project because we are building more and more IT into more and more projects. That's what's happening because of this global trend for digitalization. Well, given the fact that IT has the worst performance, it basically means that we are building ticking time bombs into all sorts of projects, whether they are water project, energy projects, transportation infrastructure projects, mining projects, or aerospace projects, whatever. The more IT you put in, the more you destabilize these projects in the sense that they are likely to get very large blowouts. So that's an issue that we are researching and, and dealing with right now. And I think it's a major issue. Now, just to circle back to this book, uh, Rationality and Power, I mean, you, 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 t you call for sort of a, uh, you know, a reexamination of, of politics, right? I mean, in the tradition of Machiavelli and Thucydides and, and, and Foucault, um, when you work on projects like the Hong Kong high-speed rail project, I mean, in the book, How Big Things Get Done, I mean, it, it, it seems like this is all about rationality and, you know, sitting down and thinking about planning and, you know, uh, coming up with approaches to proper cost estimation. But, I mean, there's, there's a ton of politics involved here. Um, you know, do you, do you think that people who engage in these types of projects fail to adequately understand the, the way – power is deployed in, in organizations and in uh, political entities? And is that sort of one of the reasons why there are so many failures? Yeah, I do think so. And I think that it's less legitimate to talk about power than it is to talk about rationality. So it's much easier. And, and by the way, on a lot of the top project types that we are talking about, including IT projects, a lot of the, there's a large dose of engineers. And of course, engineers, are trained in, in, in rationality and talking about rationality and making their projects rational. But, you know, on the big projects, engineers are actually working in political organizations. And, and again, whether they are private businesses or public government, uh, uh, there's politics in both kinds of organizations. And that means that there's pressure to do things in certain ways, like we talked about earlier, about like uh, there might be pressure on your budget that you can't you can't actually... Uh, publish too high a budget. It, it needs to be lower. And that's uh, not for rational reasons, it's for political reasons. So I find for myself and for my team, when we work on projects like the high-speed project in Hong Kong or, or the high-speed project in here in the UK, uh, then, uh, or any other project, it's really important to understand the politics. We simply cannot be effective if we don't understand the politics, even if we're not allowed to speak as directly and explicitly about it as we are about rationality, it's always in the background. And I'm really happy that I wrote the book, Rationality and Power. And I'm, I'm very pleased that you refer to it because that's a really old book, you know, but to be honest, it's the, it's the, it's the book that I put, it was the most difficult book for me to, to write. It was really difficult to get my head around the interplay between rationality and power. And it, it caused blood, sweat and tears. And it's probably the, the book that I put the most work in of mm. the 10 books that I've written. And also the one that I love the most, you know, I, I mean, obviously I love how big things get done uh, uh, very, very much. And, and it's, it's much more powerful in the sense it's about the, the kind of stuff that we're doing in the world more directly and the, the stuff we're doing today. But hey, rationality and power was my first baby. And you know how you feel about firstborn. So so that's uh, that has a special place in my heart. So thanks for bringing it up. Power is well, important. In, well, you know, in business schools, we now all have courses on power and politics. Um, but I don't think they do in engineering schools. And, uh, and I don't think they, they, they teach this stuff in, you know, your project management certification. <laughs> so I think we might want to think about importing some, some content related to organizations and, and power in that discipline. I agree. And not all business school. I think the Stanford Business School is especially, uh, you know, they, they are especially strong on power for historical reasons, you know. 
And uh, that's great in my view, but I, other business school don't may have some, but not as much. And as you say, like in engineering, often they have never heard about power, you know, uh, which is a, a big uh, drawback because if you're working on anything big, you are going to be in an organization, even small organization, there's power, wherever people are gathering, there will be power issues. And if you haven't been trained in how to deal with them, I don't know how you can be effective in a power environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to understand things the way they, the way they are, <laughs> the way they work, and not necessarily the way they should. Ben, thank you exactly. so much for joining me. This new book, How Big Things Get Done, it's it's really uh, it's really a wonderful book, um, and I hope it gets incorporated into the curriculum of anything related to projects. Thanks so much. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Thanks, Greg. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM elevating the stories of your institution.